I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. I don't have my eyes! I didn't miss about anything! Not once, not one time! Batman and Robin. One word. Why? Guys, welcome back to a much overdue hilariosity review. Now, if you are a new reviewer and you do not know what I mean by that, I have a segment on my channel in which I review movies that are such atrocities, they're hilarious. Hilariosity. It's my excuse to talk about really terrible movies that are so bad they're funny. Past examples have been The Room, The Wicker Man, The Happening, Mortal Kombat, Annihilation, and Steel. If you'd like to see my reviews for those films, the playlist link is in the description below. But this one's gonna be a little bit different because this film is so intensely bad and so incredibly hilarious that I had to have some help. I had to bring in the cavalry on this one. So I called one of my best friends and Batman super fan, John Flickinger, or the Flick Pick as you may know him. Him and I are gonna be teaming up in this video. We're gonna go back to back. I'm gonna start talking about Batman Robin. He's going to bring you some awesome points. It's going to be amazing. We're going to tag team this bitch. Let's talk about one of the dumbest movies ever made, Batman and Robin. Hey there, guys. My name is John. I want to say thanks to Chris Stuckman for having me here on this collab hilariosity review. The unfortunate thing is it's for Batman and Robin. At first, I was almost hesitant to say yes. Why? Well, it meant I had to watch the movie Batman and Robin again. I went many, many years in my life without watching this movie for good reason. Because every time I do watch it, it makes me feel cold, dark, and icky inside, and I just hate everything about myself. But since we're both Batman fanboys and we love the character of Batman, maybe a little bit too much... And also, since we both hate this atrocity against movies, why well, I thought I'd share my hate for the movie as well. So let's dive into it. All that being said, this movie actually does have some fans though. This movie is largely viewed as good by people who basically view it as a continuation of the Adam West Batman. Now, I grew up watching the original Batman show. It was hilarious. And a lot of people just view this movie as a straight up comedy as if it's supposed to be. But if you watch Batman Forever, which is also directed by Joel Schumacher, you know this movie really is actually a sequel to Batman Forever. It's not a sequel to Adam West's Batman, even though it really does feel like that at times. This movie is so bad that almost everyone involved with it has publicly apologized for it, including the director himself. If there's anybody watching this that, let's say, loved Batman Forever and went into Batman and Robin with great anticipation, if I, if I disappointed them in any way, then I really want to apologize, because it wasn't my intention. My intention was just to entertain them. And there is very strong, compelling evidence that this movie was just made to sell toys. That's why every Poison Ivy action figure comes complete with him. <laughs> in fact, there is proof that toy companies wanted them to include certain vehicles and certain outfits in the movie so they could then make a toy of that outfit or vehicle and profit. <laughs> money, money, money. Also, on a very sad and unfortunate note, this is Bob Kane's last Batman film that he saw, the creator of the Batman character. How sad indeed. So right off the bat, in the first scene in which Batman and Robin are suiting up, you get a few shots that indicate the type of movie you're about to see. What in the hell were they thinking? Butt shots. I mean, can you just see Joel Schumacher behind the camera going, okay, now now tilt the camera at a Dutch angle. Okay, now Clooney's stunt double, please turn around and hop towards the camera with your butt in frame and then cameraman, please, please zoom in on his butt. Please do that because that's... That's what this scene needs. This scene needs a butt zoom. All right, so Batman and Robin, let's pretend like you've never seen this movie before. So you sit down to watch the movie. You're a little bit excited, a little bit scared, and the first thing you see pop up on the screen is rubberized man asses, close-ups. That's what sets the tone for this movie. Close-ups of man asses. Thanks, Joel Schumacher. You really set the tone for this movie. And the tone is 
ass. And then after a short montage of man asses, the movie opens up in the Batcave and you get your first glimpse at the Batmobile. Now, I've always been a huge fan of the Batmobile. It's something I've always wanted my entire life. You give me a billion dollars, that's the first thing I'm going to buy. But I'll never buy the Batmobile from Batman and Robin. Just look at this neon nightmare. It looks like a futuristic sex toy. Just from the few quick shots you get to see of the Batcave, you have to ask yourself something. How much of this film's budget went to fluorescent light bulbs? And of course, we cannot go without mentioning that the suits are anatomically correct in every way, including nipples. Now, there was some subtle nippage on Val Kilmer's bat suit in Batman Forever. It was a little subtle nippage. It was like they tried to sneak a little nip. They were trying to sneak that nip. And the movie made a lot of money, and so they're like, okay, let's go full-fledged nip. Let's do a circle, and then the actual nip. We'll put it on the suit with Bat and Robin nips. That's what we need. We need Bat nips. And they did it. It was in a movie. Like, we sat in a theater, and the camera pans up Batman. And there's large, protrusive Bat nipples. It happened on Earth. This movie happened on planet Earth. Now, please observe the first exchange of dialogue in this movie. I want a car. Chicks dig the car. This is why Superman works alone. I want a car. Chicks dig the car. Shut up, Robin. Oh, and by the way, if you're Alfred, do yourself a favor and do not order pizza because Batman and Robin are gonna be busy. Don't order pizza. I'll cancel the pizza. And as Batman and Robin drive away, we get the most obvious, oh my God, Alfred is sick shot. I mean, seriously, look how long it lingers on it. Now here's something that not a lot of people actually talk about. For some reason, this scene always confuses me. First off, Commissioner Gordon pops up and gives us a ton of Mr. Freeze exposition. Batman, a new villain has commandeered the Gotham Museum. He's frozen the antiquities wing. He's turned the security guards into blocks of ice. He's calling himself Mr. Freeze. Mr. Freeze. He acts as if Mr. Freeze is new and unheard of, but Batman's reply is Mr. Freeze. Like he knows who Mr. Freeze is, but Commissioner Gordon said he's new. I don't get it. It's such a small little point, but it's bugged me for years. So we're now introduced to Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze, one of the dumbest casting choices ever. I mean, seriously, this is the Terminator, okay? His next villain role after the Terminator is Mr. Freeze in Batman and Robin. We've gone down, my friends. Now it's time to dive into the really, really bad stuff. Some could even call it chilling. Now I love Arnold, but as Mr. Freeze, it just didn't quite work out. <laughs> Within the first nine seconds of being introduced to the character of Mr. Freeze, he gives two puns about ice. And don't worry, there's about 2,000 more coming over the next two hours of this movie. You are not sending me to the cooler. What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age! Cool party! Now I did do a Batman and Robin review in the past with my buddies the Schmoes. And you may have remembered in that review that I talked about the fact that every single Batman has an amazing way of saying, I'm Batman. From Michael Keaton, to Val Kilmer, to Christian Bale, they all did a very cool Batman speech in which they said who they are. Here's a look back at those. I'm Batman. You see, I'm both Bruce Wayne and Batman. Not because I have to be. No. Because I choose to be. I'm Batman. Now please observe George Clooney's attempt at saying who he is. Hi, Freeze. I'm Batman. <laughs> Hi, Freeze. I'm Batman. It's like he's talking to a guy at the mall. Hey, I'm Batman. Good for you, man. You're a fucking psycho. Hi, Freeze. I'm Batman. And I thought my jokes were bad. And of course, after his introduction, he slides down a dinosaur tail, and every time I see it, this is what I think of. Hey, Freeze. I'm Batman. And it's at that point you realize that George Clooney is not Batman. He's not Bruce Wayne. He's just George Clooney in a rubberized Batman suit with nipples. 
That's all you're getting here. Yeah, the rubber nipples on the bat suit. Two reasons to never watch this movie. Reason number one and reason number two. And by the way, on a side note, I like George Clooney as an actor. But as Batman, he was just miscast, as was everyone in this movie. And even George Clooney will agree that his role as Batman just didn't make any sense whatsoever. Can you imagine if we had, like, ads on TV campaigning against other actors for roles and stuff? Like, <laughs> over-actor, you know? Like? Yeah. It would just be shots of me in a rubber suit and a Batman <laughs> outfit. <laughs> for your consideration, ass. <laughs> Now let's continue on talking about this opening action sequence and just how bloated and bad it really is. So you have zombie hockey players skating around and then all of a sudden Batman and Robin are laying on their backs and then Batman and Robin click their heels together and out come ice skates. Yeah, they have built-in ice skates in their boots because why the hell not? It's Batman and Robin. Anything goes. And I'll be honest with you, it was at this point in the movie for the last 17 years, I've shut the movie off every time. I'm just like, that's too much, I can't take it any longer. But this time, I kept going. And it hurt, but I kinda liked it. And when you conclusively break down this opening action sequence in Batman and Robin, it comes across like a bad cruise ship on ice show, featuring Batman. Except that shitty cruise ship show with Batman on ice skating around would be more compelling and better acted. Probably with better stunt work too. Now not a lot of people notice this next moment because it's kind of in the background, but I've unfortunately had the pleasure, I guess you could call it that, of examining Batman and Robin from beginning to end in preparation for this review. When Robin launches through the wall, his motorcycle actually creates the Robin symbol. This never gets a close up because I'm pretty sure the filmmakers realized how stupid that is. But if you look in the background, you can see it. Now throughout this scene, there are some mind-blowing displays of physics in action, or lack thereof. Now after Freeze gets into his rocket ship and blasts into the air, he seems to reveal that he has an odd sexual fetish for switches. Oh yes. Who turns a switch like that? I mean, when you walk into your room and you turn on your light, do you go, oh yes? No, you don't. No one does that ever, just Mr. Freeze. Oh yes. But unfortunately, the scene doesn't end there. It keeps going and going. At one point, Mr. Freeze runs over to his getaway mobile. It turns into a rocket ship. He shoots up into the sky, and then some things happen, and then he jumps out of that to turn into a Mr. Freeze butterfly. And you just have to ask yourself two things. One, why does Mr. Freeze have a rocket ship? And two, why did he turn into a butterfly? I don't know. Now, of course, at the end of this scene, Batman and Robin escape the exploding ship by surfing on air on pieces of the door. In just like the first 10 minutes of this movie, we've got butt shots, nips, surfing on air, Mr. Freeze and his crazy Arnold Schwarzeneggerisms, and Physics. This movie jumped the shark like 50 times already. And then a few seconds later, Batman and Robin confront Mr. Freeze, and Robin gets frozen after trying to make a heroic failed attempt to stop him. By the way, if you really break down this scene and you look at Robin jumping at Mr. Freeze, he would have only jumped about three feet, and Mr. Freeze was like 25 feet away. So what was Robin thinking? Oh, we've only covered the opening scene so far. This movie's two hours long. Most comedies are only supposed to be an hour and a half. Let's just keep going. So if you're already in pain at the portrayal of Mr. Freeze, we now get the most purposefully over-the-top Poison Ivy they could have done. I mean, they're going for it. You know, there isn't like an accident here. Uma Thurman's portrayal of Poison Ivy is so hilariously over-the-top. I mean, it's exploding over the brim. I have spent my life trying to protect plants from extinction, and now you corrupt my research. Then of course, there's Bane. Or should I say Frankenstein, because he's just some strange green thing created in a lab by a crazy mad scientist for the purpose of selling him to some weird place who wants to buy green people who are made. I'm just gonna skip talking about Bane because I know John wants to delve into this because he's a massive Bane fan, so I'm just gonna let him talk about Bane. Now, if you thought this movie couldn't possibly get any worse, well, I assure you, it does. Next up, we're talking about the introduction of the characters of Poison Ivy and Bane. <laughs> oh, 
fuck? That thing that they call Bane in this movie, that's not Bane. That's a big bloated green veiny pickle jacked up on steroids who just randomly mumbles words. We've got work to do. <sighs> Monkey work. That's not Bane. And then you have the character of Poison Ivy played by Uma Thurman. And Poison Ivy in this movie was probably the most over-the-top character of the entire film. And that's really saying something, because yeah, Mr. Freeze is also in this film. But at times, it's like Uma Thurman thought she was in some live-action porn about plants. And you're like, this chick really likes plants. Maybe a little bit too much. But the best worst part about this introduction scene to Bane and Poison Ivy is when the mad scientist confronts Uma Thurman's character and he gives a line that only Nicolas Cage could get away with saying. Well, in that case, I'm afraid you'll have to die. <laughs> I'm afraid you'll have to die. <laughs> and then he pushes her over her table and she turns into Poison Ivy. How climactic. But in all fairness to Uma Thurman, I'm pretty sure she was just following the vision of director Joel Schumacher, and that vision was to do whatever the hell producers told him to do so they could sell some more toys. And look over there, kids! There's rubber bat nipples! Suck on those! Because I don't give a fuck about Batman. You're watching Batman and Robin, a two-hour-long toy commercial. You better like it, and buy some toys while you're at it. And by the way, on a side note, this scene also shows two of the same clips of Bane flexing. Yeah, right here and right here. Same clip, used twice. So now we get more Mr. Freeze exposition in which Bruce and Dick and Alfred, they all watch security camera footage of how he became Mr. Freeze. Of course, this security camera footage is filmed like a movie, complete with pans and zooms and sound. <sighs> So Poison Ivy gets created, she actually literally sprouts from the ground, and then all of a sudden she seems to know exactly what has happened to her body. And if you didn't already understand the direction this movie was going, next there's a scene in which Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze tries to conduct his various cronies to sing along with him. <sighs> This scene also contains some of the worst dubbing I've seen in a big budget film. It's winter forever here in Gotham. It's winter forever here in Gotham. And for whatever reason, the writers thought we needed even more characters in this movie. So we have Alicia Silverstone as Batgirl because apparently we needed Batgirl in this movie. But she's not Barbara Gordon as she is in the comics. She's Barbara Wilson. And for whatever reason, Apparently, Alfred is her uncle. Now, I know that the writers are just looking for a convenient reason for her to show up on Wayne Manor's doorstep, and that's all they could think of. And it's so annoying that they couldn't just just, just have her be Barbara Gordon. Just could, could you just give us that one little thing that's like the comics, just that one thing. Also starring in Batman and Robin is an actress who hasn't been relevant since the 1990s, Alicia Silverstone. And you have to ask yourself this, why would they cast Clueless as Batgirl? But then again, why would you cast George Clooney as Batman? Nothing makes sense. But speaking of Alicia Silverstone, on a positive note, she probably has the most subtle performance in this entire film. Yeah, compare her to Uma Thurman's character Poison Ivy, She's almost giving an Oscar-worthy performance at times if you make the comparison. And it's around this point in the movie where you realize they're really not going to attempt to flesh out Bruce Wayne's character at all. He wanders around, he goes to rich banquets and auctions, and he says things and goes like this. I'm George Clooney. Good night. I'm Batman. Hey, Freeze. I'm Batman. That's my George Clooney Batman impression. There really are no attempts to flesh out Bruce Wayne as a character in this movie. We just get really awkward pauses. <laughs> you see, the major issue with George Clooney's portrayal as Batman, which could have been in the writing or his direction as well, is the fact that he plays the same character in all three of Bruce's roles. Now, a good Batman has three characters. That's Bruce Wayne, as he is in the public eye, a playboy asshole. That's Bruce Wayne, as he actually is, in the Batcave with Alfred, and Batman. Three different characters. He plays the same character no matter what in this movie. All right, guys, let's talk about the auction scene. Yeah, the auction scene. <laughs> Now, 
Now they try to make this scene make sense by adding some brief little exchange between Batman and Robin in which they say essentially that they're trying to bait Mr. Freeze by having all these jewels because Mr. Freeze needs him to power his suit or whatever. But it's really just obvious that Schumacher is trying to have another circus scene. He really wants Batman to be a fucking circus. That's all he wants. Big shiny lights and circus and men in their little outfits and fucking gorillas and what the f what the fuck are you doing with this movie, Schumacher? This is Batman, not nipply circus action man. <laughs> now, as stated, I rewatched this movie in preparation for this review. I did so with my wife because she said, I will take it with you. We'll do it together. We'll tackle it. I was like, you're the best. I love you. And when it got to this scene with the fucking gorilla, she said, and I'll never forget it, she just went, I don't really understand what's going on here. That's how everyone felt at that moment and through the majority of this movie's runtime. Now when Poison Ivy shows herself, a whole bunch of shirtless men with glitter on their chests catch her. Yes, this is a Batman movie. I feel the need to continuously reiterate, this is a Batman movie and her awesome entrance line is this. Why not send Junior home early? I've got some wild oats to sow. Well, you better get going to sow those oats, Poison Ivy, because you gotta get those oats sowed. Now it's at this point in the film we come to the charity auction scene and this is where Poison Ivy becomes a full-fledged porn star. Just listen to some of the shit that she says. My garden needs tending. Some lucky boy is about to hit the honey pot. I bring everything you see plus everything you don't. What a whore. Now listen, as a dude, I don't really mind some of those one-liners. They're a little bit exciting at times, but they just feel like they'd be in a video that you would come across on Pornhub.com that would also have Batman in it. By the way, if you look hard enough, you can actually find that video. I guarantee it. So she starts to blow her mist around and it makes everyone infatuated with her and everyone starts to bid for her, including Batman and Robin. They're going back and forth, millions and millions of dollars. And you guys know exactly what I'm getting at. Batman has a credit card. Seven million. Never leave the cave without it. <laughs> and if you looked real closely, you'll notice it's good for Ever. And it's at that point in the movie, I once again question why I am watching this. And when I actually watched this movie to take notes for this video, I turned it off right there, I went outside, I screamed up at the moon, and then I came back in and finished the movie. And then after that, a few seconds later, Mr. Freeze breaks in the door and says, cool potty. And I think that's his 87th ice pun of the movie at this point, and he starts freezing people. And then once all the chaos settles down, and there's a lot of frozen people in the background, Batman casually walks by Commissioner Gordon and says, you have 11 minutes to throw these people out. And then he just takes off out the door after Mr. Freeze. Commissioner, you have 11 minutes to throw these people. Well, thanks, Batman. Thanks for all the help. I don't have a special bat laser like you had or a convenient pool of water to put these frozen people in. So how the hell is Commissioner Gordon supposed to thaw these people out in 11 minutes? It's like, thanks, Batman. Can I maybe borrow some of your handy gadgets to save these people's lives? I mean, you have ice skates built into your boots. Can I borrow one of your extra lasers? No, you're just going to leave. Well, fuck you, too. Yeah, I think it's safe to assume all those people frozen in that scene died. They're dead because of Batman. Apparently, Mr. Freeze's exit cue was a random guy falling in front of him. Uh, that's my exit cue. He really planned this attack very well. He knew exactly when to leave. He was like, when the random guy falls in front of me, the owl, then when he falls down, it's my exit cue. Ah. And I gotta bring up the jumping physics, the absurd physics in this movie. What were they thinking? Everyone in this movie looks like they're wearing a wire that just propels them into the air at will. So as they chase Mr. Freeze, it goes outside. Batman catches Mr. Freeze. Now please observe how he does this. Is Batman in this moment breaking the fourth wall? Is he actually like, hey audience watching, Look at Mr. Freeze, I caught him. Did Batman put Mr. Freeze on the ground, then cover him up with his cape, only to pull up said cape and go, look what I did. I don't 
that shot makes no sense, guys. So now we get a random Jesse Ventura cameo, which only makes me wish I was watching Predator. And for whatever reason, the filmmakers thought every 30 minutes or so, they should have some random relationship drama with a girl who has the most obvious audio dubbed voice since Arnold Schwarzenegger 20 minutes ago in the same movie. I know you're a dedicated bachelor. I know you've had your wild night. Batman captures Mr. Freeze, putting him in Arkham Asylum, and then the next scene you see Mr. Freeze in a refrigerator being wheeled down the hallways of Arkham. Now it's bad enough when watching this movie and having to deal with all of Mr. Freeze's corny punny one-liners related to ice, but in this scene, even the jail guards are joining in on it. Welcome home, Frostface. You're the common cold and we're the cure. <sighs> and then Mr. Freeze has to one-up them both by saying, allow me to break the ice. I'm Freeze. And it's just like... <laughs> it's like they already know that, Mr. Freeze. That's why they're making jokes about cold shit. Now let's get back to Alicia Silverstone. That's right, she's still in the movie, and she lives a double life by racing motorcycles at night to earn a little bit of extra cash to pay back her Uncle Alfred. Which, by the way, Alfred in this movie is dying. Did I mention that before? It's a subplot. It doesn't really matter. So during this bike racing scene, it really reminds me of a scene that you would see out of the movie The Warriors that came out in the 1970s. You have all these flamboyant gangs dressed like clowns just standing around. And of course, what's a Batman movie without Coolio? This is the guy who sang the Keenan and Kel theme song. Right around then, he was pretty popular. And I guess they thought, hey, we'll put him in the movie because... He's Coolio, and he should be in our Batman film that Bob Kane saw, and then he passed away. Oh, that's bad. And can we please talk about the green screen in this scene with Batgirl hanging? What in the hell were they thinking? Now, in the background, they're clearly using a green screen, and then in the foreground, they're shooting it with a camera, but both things are shaking at different variations. Like, somebody took the green screen footage and shook that, and during filming of the scene, someone shook that, but neither shakes line up. So both things are going back and forth like that, and you're like, what is happening here? How is this? It almost looks like an earthquake is taking place during this scene. So then a few minutes later, Bane and Ivy break Mr. Freeze out of Arkham Asylum, and it's during this scene where Poison Ivy gives one of the best lines I've ever heard in my entire life. This is one of those lines where you can tell that the writer really sat down for days and, you know, used pure integrity and creativeness to come up with it, and not including this line in a feature-length film would be a crime against cinema. I'll help you grab your rocks. Yeah, Poison Ivy's just a porn star in this movie. That's all she is, a porn star with a plant fetish. So Ivy and Freeze team up, big whoopity doo, who cares? You all knew it was happening. Why else would they be in the movie if not to team up in some way? Now, as you guys know, one of the coolest parts of Batman in the comics and in the better Batman films is that Batman is a detective. This is something that the original animated series nailed. Now, here is the film's only attempt at showing Batman as a detective. Poison Ivy, why would she help freeze escape. Well, she's definitely evil. Now let's quickly talk about a random scene in this movie that's always just bothered me for some odd reason. At one point in this movie, Commissioner Gordon's doing some actual police work for the first time ever, and he's showing Batman a few pictures of Poison Ivy and Bane. In one picture, they're breaking Mr. Freeze out of Arkham, and the other picture, they're arriving at an airport. Now let's take a closer look at this picture of Bane and Poison Ivy at the airport. First of all, this airport looks like some stock photo of an airport from 1949. They terribly Photoshop Bane and Poison Ivy into the picture and look at their disguises. Look how not discreet they're being. Look at that. Bane's wearing a trench coat and Poison Ivy just looks like she's up to something. Nice disguise, guys. But it's not the pictures that bother me about the scene. It's what Batman says after he sees the pictures. This is definitely the same pair that sprang freeze. Well, no shit, Batman. Who else could it be? There's a big bloated guy in a trench coat and some sexy, seductive, plant fetish porn star in the other one. How could you ever not think it was the same people in both pictures? Thanks, Captain Obvious. I thought you were a master detective. No, you're just George Clooney with rubber nipples. So Batman and Robin and Bane have what could be a really epic fight scene, but is really just them punching each other once or twice and then throwing in a really terrible pun. There might as well be big pow and kabam words just appearing above them. 
Now it's a few minutes later on in the movie where we finally get to see the big epic showdown go down. Batman versus Bane. And as a kid who loved Bane from the comic books, this was something I always wanted to see go down in a live action movie. And then this happened. And this fight scene between Batman and Bane isn't good to say the least. And it's interrupted every four seconds by Poison Ivy just spewing out some corny one-liner. It just keeps cutting back and forth between them fighting and Poison Ivy saying random dumb shit about plants. Oh yeah, let's get back to the Batman versus Bane fight scene. Or if you want to call it a fight scene. It's pretty much just these two guys stumbling over each other. Then all of a sudden, Bane punches a snowman and falls into some boxes. What an epic conclusion to that showdown. Now, now it's at this point in the movie where they finally unveil Mr. Freeze and Poison Ivy's master plan. And here's what their plan is. Mr. Freeze wants to blanket the entire planet in ice and Poison Ivy wants to repopulate the earth with her little shop of horror plants that have mouths. And I have a question. Don't plants need sunlight and warmth to grow? So how is this plan ever going to coincide with one another? How did they not logistically think about this plan not working whatsoever with one another? But yet, they team up to do it anyway. Now let's continue on with a few other small details that have always just bothered me about the movie Batman and Robin. Now in this scene we're talking about, Batman and Robin infiltrate Mr. Freeze's hideout. They go into his freezer room where he keeps all his frozen TV dinners, and they slide back one, and behind this is a hidden button. But the button is the size of an iPad, and is glowing blue. Now you would think if they went through all that trouble to hide this button, which opens up a secret passageway, they maybe would have made the button a little bit smaller, a little bit more discreet. Nah, let's just make it as big as an iPad and make it glow blue. It's like, why would you go through all the trouble of even hiding it in the first place? I guess over embellishing everything is the theme of this movie. And then during this same scene, Mr. Freeze is actually sneaking around his hideout, and then he jumps out into a room of police officers, pulling a lever, unleashing the freeze mist. Now let's take a closer look at what's actually happening here. If you pay close attention, the fog is barely touching half of the police officers, and the guy in the background's not even being affected whatsoever. He could just walk away and be completely okay. Why is he coughing? Why is he choking? And everyone else that's actually in the fog mist could walk one step forward and be completely okay. It's almost like they started filming the scene before they could completely fog up the room to make it look logical, or get another fog machine in there to make it happen quicker, but it's Batman and Robin. Why do things that make sense? And the way Batgirl discovers Batman and Robin's secret identity is so stupid with the images projected directly onto her face from a computer. Computer screens do not reflect perfect projected images onto your face like that. Speaking of computer things that don't make any sense, Batgirl discovers that Alfred has used his brain algorithms to create a consciousness that is able to interact with Batgirl and provide her with a Batgirl costume. Suit me up, Uncle Alfred. I'm done. Okay, I'm getting a little bit tired. Let's jump towards the end of this movie and quickly mention this scene right here. Hi! Oh, I'm sorry about the door. Is the party over? Yeah, only Arnold could pull off something like that. Any other actor trying to do that, it wouldn't be as funny or comedic. So, Arnold. I love the guy, but Mr. Freeze, you... <laughs> oh. And speaking of charismatic one-liners, a few seconds later, we get this scene right here from Bane. Bomb. 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 Thanks for that great scene, Bane Tard. Now go eat some applesauce. All right, let's dive deeper into the ending of this turd. At the very end of the movie, you have Batman, Batgirl, and Robin. They all have new costumes to obviously sell more toys. And then all of a sudden, yeah, how did Alicia Silverstone become Batgirl so quick? Within 30 seconds, she becomes Batgirl. I guess no special training is required because as soon as you put on the Batgirl suit, you're instantly a superhero. So now we get a scene where Robin gets the upper hand on Ivy's poisonous kiss. And he says one of the film's most hilarious lines that was written by a person. Rubber lips are immune to your charms. And the film took it so seriously, too. The scene, it's like this big epic moment. <laughs> you might as well have just been like, my nipples are hard right now, Poison Ivy. 
What do you think about that? So now Batgirl's in on the action. She's fighting Poison Ivy. And please take note of this shot because you need to remember that for later. And Ivy is somehow defeated by one of her babies. I don't know how that even happened, but it just did, I guess. That plant was just like, fuck this bitch. I'm sick of this shit, man. All these people up in here tell me what to do. I just, I'm just gonna eat her. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna eat her. Apparently that plant was Samuel L. Jackson. I don't know where that impression came from. And you are? That girl. That's not awfully PC. What about bad person or bad woman? That's not awfully politically correct. How about butt shots and bat nipples for PC? So the big finale starts and my one question is where in the hell did they get their new costumes? Did they go back to the bat cave and change them? These costumes that were made specifically to sell toys? Now please observe how awful Batgirl's cowl looks. In fact, it's so bad. It's almost like they were just making it up as they went along because like 30 seconds later, she takes it off and throws it on the ground. It's literally like she wore or that awful cowl just so they could have another Batgirl action figure with said cowl on. Within a minute later, they're like, this thing looks like shit. Throw it on the ground. And then after that, you see all three heroes driving separate vehicles to the final location of the film. And the only reason they're all driving separately to the exact same location is, well, they wanted to sell some more fucking toys. And then finally the big action bloated climax goes down and it's just atrocious to look at. You have all these actors dangling on wires, doing way too many flips. You're like, is this an acrobatic stunt show or a Batman movie? Nothing looks good. It's all cringeworthy. And speaking of cringeworthy, the scene that happens during all this is where Bane finally gets defeated. Yeah, they ripped the venom out of him and he starts to shrink back down. And I can't even describe how funny it is. Just watch it. Yeah, Bane lost all of his gains and that moan was just glorious. And then after that, shit gets really bad. You have Batman along with two other scientists falling to their deaths on the side of this cliff. And during all this, Robin and Batgirl are looking on and Batgirl looks to Robin and says, what should we do now? And Robin says, Pray. What did you just say, Robin? You're the superhero sidekick to Batman, and you said, let's just pray? How about you take out your grappling hook and shoot it towards Batman to help save his life? That's what you have it for. And Batman being the badass that he is, he saves the day all on his own by shooting his grappling hooks into the sky and stopping everyone from falling. But instead of taking the scientists back to the top of the cliff, where they're safe and secure, he leaves them both on the side of this icy cold cliff where they're surely going to die of hypothermia within the next 10 minutes. This is one of those movies where characters say things really quickly and fast, so you hopefully won't realize how dumb it is. Like relaying sunlight from the Congo using satellites to create a light beam to melt the city of Gotham. Yes. Things like that. Sunlight could reverse the freezing process. Well, sunrise in for five hours. Here. But it's morning in the Congo. If we could relay the sunlight. From the other side of the equator. It'll take the satellites about a minute to realign, but... And Mr. Freeze and Batman have their big epic fight. And it ends with Batman saying some big line that's supposed to be incredibly epic. Now, Batman films in the past have said things like this, and they've worked quite a bit. I won't kill you, but I don't have to save you. You killed my parents. I made you. You made me first. Let's take a look at George Clooney's epic Batman line. Hey, Freeze. The heat is on. <laughs> hey, Freeze. The heat is on. Now, if you recall earlier, I said, remember that shot of Poison Ivy? That's because Batman uses it as if he recorded it or something to show Mr. Freeze that Ivy actually killed his wife. But it's the same shot as earlier. This movie constantly uses security camera footage or footage recorded by someone, and it's a fucking movie shot with production and everything. Now, of course, Mr. Freeze has the cure for Alfred's disease, and his IV even has a perfect slot Taylor made for Mr. Freeze's vial. And of course, Alfred is perfectly fine the following morning. Thank goodness we didn't get another one of these things. Now, let's talk about the last shot in this movie. It's one of the scariest things I've ever seen in my life, and I'll explain what I'm talking about in just a second. But the last shot is Batman, Robin, 
and Batgirl running at the camera in slow motion with a spotlight behind them as if to get us excited for a third movie. Who would want to see all that come together? But here's the really scary thing. Think about this. If this movie was successful and made the money that they wanted it to make and people actually liked it, you would have had that third installment directed by Joel Schumacher. All right, so that's my take on Batman and Robin. Probably one of the worst movies ever made and without a doubt, the worst comic book movie ever made, or at least to me it was. This movie's just cringeworthy, bloated nothingness. It's basically a two-hour toy commercial, except toy commercials have better acting and better directing in them. And there's not one redeeming quality Quality about this entire movie. Now you could say it's so bad at times it's funny, but the truth is the only reason we're laughing is to keep from crying because this is by far the worst Batman movie ever made. But on a positive note, had it not been for this abomination against humanity known as Batman and Robin, well we never would have got the rebooted Batman Begins. They would have just continued down the road with shitty Batman movies because they make money and sell toys. But this one didn't quite live up to what they wanted it to. Now look, if there's one thing we have this movie to thank for, it's that people were so awestruck by how bad Batman could actually be that we got Batman Begins. So thank goodness for that. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this hilariosity review and I really want to thank my buddy John Flickinger, the Flick Pick. Without him, this could not have been nearly as awesome. Definitely subscribe to him. This guy is awesome. He's one of my best friends. He makes quality entertainment. And just look at those muscles. I mean, just, just look at those muscles. Just rub some baby oil on those things, man. You can find a link for his channel in the description below, as well as a link to my other Hilariosity reviews in playlist form, as mentioned earlier. So that's everything I had to say about Batman and Robin. And once again, thanks to my good pal, Chris Stuckman, for having me here to share my thoughts and my hate towards this movie. It felt really good. I feel a little bit better about who I am and what I'm doing in life now. So anyway, yeah, thanks for having me here and thanks for watching, guys. Guys, thank you so much as always for watching. I look forward to doing more of these very soon. And I apologize, I haven't done too many for a while. Thank you so much, guys. And if you like this, you can click right here and get Stuckmanized. Hi, Freeze, I'm Batman. No, you're not.